Oscars. So today we continue our series uh, titled Follow Me. We're talking about the call to discipleship that presents itself in the life of Simon Peter. And our message today is called Trusting Jesus to Provide. I want to ask you a question as we begin. Have you ever wished upon a falling star? I, I saw the other day someone had posted something on, on Facebook. Now, I wasn't up at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, but, but they showed this picture of, of a, a, a shooting star. And, and it just made me think about the fact that, that some, from the time that I was just a little boy, they always said, you know, if you see a falling star, you should do a wish. And I think Disney even made a, a big theme out of it. Um, now, I'm not really superstitious, but I was, I was reflecting on the fact that we all have those things in life that we wish for. Maybe it's something as simple as a, a new vacuum cleaner. And I hear the laughter there. <laughs> Nobody really wishes for a new vacuum cleaner. Well, maybe someone does. Or, or, or maybe it could be something as, 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 as large as peace on earth, especially in these times where, where we hear of, of the wars and the suffering around the world. On the other hand, most of us simply want to know from day to day that our basic needs will be met, that there will be enough food on the table, that there will be a roof over our head and a good night's sleep. I think there's probably not someone here today who doesn't wish for, hope for, plan for those simple things. And that's where Jesus comes in. He says, if you follow me, I will take care of you. I will be with you to meet your needs. It is what we expect of God. We often call on God when we have a, a, an issue, a problem, when there's some need in our life, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual. That's when we stop and we, we pray and we ask God. God doesn't tell us that if we go to Him, that life will be easy. He says He will be with us. He says, trust me. We've seen it played out in the stories of the Old Testament, whether it was in the provision of manna to the Israelites as they were wandering through the wilderness. Each day, the, the, the manna would come from heaven. It would be like snow falling, and they'd be able to collect enough for that day. And uh, or the quail that would come, and, and he would lead them with a, with a cloud of smoke or the pillar of fire. God led them, and they knew, and they could trust on him to be there every day. We read about it in the story of Elijah after the great battle with Ahab, uh, he, he running in the wilderness, worn out. At one point, he says, God, just take my life from me. I can't take it anymore. And what does he do? He sends an angel to bring him bread and water to sustain him for the day. When God is with you, even in the most difficult situations, you can trust Him to take care of you. And what we saw in the Old Testament is true in the New Testament too. We see that being played out in our text today with Simon Peter. Like the account we read last week from Matthew, Jesus shows up and starts addressing a crowd of onlookers. It's funny because I... As I was reading the text in Luke today that Pastor Enrique read earlier, I was saying, didn't we read this last week? And you know, sometimes when you're reading the gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, you sometimes wonder if they're telling the same stories. Well, here's the secret, they are. <laughs> but they tell them from a little slightly different vantage point, from a different eyewitness account. And so, so what Matthew tells us last week that we looked at was, he came, he was addressing the crowd, and he says to them who are in their boats, come and follow me. Luke takes that story and gives us a little bit more information in Luke chapter 5 tells us that Jesus shows up, he starts addressing the crowd of onlookers, and then, and then tells us that, that Jesus sees a couple of empty fishing boats there, and he looks and he sees some fishermen on the shore cleaning their nets, and so he invites them to take him out a little ways in the boat so that he can address the crowd and create kind of an amphitheater effect as they are on the shore. We don't know what he said, 
But some scholars suggest that he included part of what was one of his traditional sermons, that Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain from Matthew or Luke, where he says things like, blessed are those. Whatever he said, it must have touched a chord in Simon Peter's life because of what happened next. The carpenter asked the fishermen to give fishing another go. And you get what you'd expect from Peter, he began to make excuses. Lord, we've been out there all night. We haven't caught anything. We're the professionals. We know what we're doing. You stick to carpentry. People tell me that a lot too. They say, you stick to preaching. You let me. This morning, if you had come by my office, you would have seen Ray Diptowski putting together my rolling whiteboard because I tried it and I couldn't do it. <laughs> That's why people tell me stick to the preaching. But Peter doesn't do that. He, he makes his complaints, but then he says, okay, Lord, if you say to go out a little deeper and to throw the nets again, we'll do it. Now, again, I, I'm putting my spin on it. I'm thinking he does it begrudgingly because I'm inflecting myself in that story because I know that people have asked me to do things that I've done before, and, and I may do it, but I do it begrudgingly. So Peter says, okay, you're the master. And then maybe he's thinking about what Jesus had just said. And he says, why not? And so he gets the boat out and he throws the net overboard, something they had probably been doing all night with no results. And before he can turn around, the net starts pulling. And so he and Andrew, his brother, start pulling. The, and and there, there is something in there that is so overwhelmingly large. They call to James and John and say, hey, you better get out here. You better come too. And James and John come rushing out. And they're there. And they throw out their nets. And before they know, it says they had so many fish within the nets that the boats were, were about to sink. Probably their largest catch of the year. Something that, that no one thought was possible. It was like... A miracle. A place where there had been no fish. Now suddenly there were more fish than you could count. Now, I don't know what it was that caused Peter to go out. Maybe it was a look in Jesus' eye when he said, trust me. Now you have to remember that a fisherman makes their livelihood by catching fish. And since these guys had been out all night and had nothing to show for it, they were probably a little disappointed before Jesus shows up, they were ready to go home empty-handed without any reward for their efforts. Now, why is this important? I think the answer lies in what happens next. Because immediately after that, as they come into shore, Jesus says to them, come and follow me. Like the account from Matthew, it says they dropped their nets, they left everything behind, and they went with him. Now that takes guts. Most of us couldn't do that. If Jesus came to you today and said, George, I want you to quit your job and come and follow me. You're going to be a preacher here. Next week, you're up. <laughs> Sorry to pick on you, George, but you know maybe George would do that. He's got a heart for Christ. His wife would probably say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> takes guts. Most of us couldn't do it. We have families. We have obligations. We need to work in order to pay the bills. As a matter of fact, with inflation, with a rising medical cost, with job insecurity and the like, I bet a lot of us worry if we're going to have enough money to make our monthly bills. You know, when Lori retired earlier this year, we had to sit down and figure out if we're going to be able to survive. I know many of you have already gone through this as you've retired in recent years. I remember we had someone in the Norwich congregation who after he retired from the telephone company, he had a, he had a great wage and, and, and he, he decided that they didn't want to deal with their house anymore so they sold their house and they decided to move into an apartment. They thought it would be cheaper. They could take that store of money, that $34,000 they got for their house <laughs> and then they could live forever. Five years later, that apartment complex turned into condos, and they had to buy a new condo for $112,000. You know, when you retire, you wonder. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Over the years, I know a lot of people who just in living life have, have, have had to make accommodations. I know many people who are children of the Great Depression, and one commonality that many of them have is, is that the propensity to hold on to things. 
They want to ensure that they have enough in case there's another economic downturn. And sometimes it even leads to hoarding. Now, hoarding in a good way, when Lori and I bought our first house, it was a, a 1915 house. And, and one family, the owner, Leroy Peckham, actually built it himself. And, uh, and when his, he had passed away and his wife had it, she was moving into a nursing home. And, uh, and so we bought it. They were a church family. They gave us a, a great deal. And I remember going down into the basement. And Mr. Peckham had all these little baby bottles filled with screws, nuts, bolts. Whatever. He had so many of them. I could have put the house together myself all over again. Yeah. He, he had been collecting those. And, and uh, his daughter said, well, he always wanted to have them in case he needed them. Maybe some of you resemble that. God knows that there is a natural inclination for us to grab onto and hold on to things because we're not sure of what will happen in the world around us in the days to come. That's why God told the Israelites only to take enough manna for the day when he provided for them in the wilderness. It was a test. God was saying, I will take care of you. Do you trust me? And again, the scriptures reveal that for those few that, that weren't sure and they took more than they needed, that in the morning when they woke up, that yesterday's provision had spoiled. And then there was a new provision. And 40 years in the wilderness, they knew that every day God would provide their daily bread. I think that's why when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread. It was really an effort to get us to, to hold on to and trust God for today's provisions. Growing up, I always heard that we should never put God to the test. I mentioned that earlier. And there's only one place where God says, test me, and that's when we give of ourselves, when we give of our tithes and offerings, when we give of our time and our energy. Someone said we only have so many hours and so many days, but it seems like when we put them to use for the Lord, those days are extended and our hours are given back to us in other ways. Which brings me back to our text today. In this amazing story, Jesus shows Simon Peter that if Peter will trust him in what he's going to ask him to do, that he will provide for him. No wonder he and the others dropped their nets and followed him. That great mass of fish was going to take care of them for days and days and days and so that they could leave the fishing boats and go with Jesus. I want to ask you, what do you need today? Are you struggling financially? Are you wrestling with a career choice, or, or maybe on the other end of the spectrum, are you wrestling with, should I retire or not? Are you trying to decide on a move? Maybe we want to downsize our house. Maybe we need to buy a bigger house. Maybe there's an opportunity somewhere, and we might have to move our family. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you today to put that need in Jesus' hands, and then go out and follow him. I want to give you five things to take away from this story today. And the first is this. This is a truth. Jesus already knows our needs. He knows them before we even say it. You know, sometimes, sometimes I've had people come to me and say, I, I don't know if I should pray about this. You know, it's such a small thing. The truth is, is that if it's on your heart and mind, God already knows it. And so I encourage you to give it to him. It's not a surprise to, to Jesus. The truth is he knows what we need even before we do at times. What's more, he has a plan in place to meet that need. For example, he knew that the fishermen were dependent on their daily catch for their living. The fact that they came up short that day that he encountered them was not disappointing to Jesus. I'm sure if they were like us, they were probably thinking about that whole situation, what were they going to do now? They had no fish as they were sitting on shore cleaning their nets, wondering how they were going to pay their bills. Jesus saw Simon overworked, overwhelmed, stressed, and tired sitting there. And so what does Jesus do? He asked Peter to add one more thing to his to-do list. Maybe you felt that. Pastor comes up to you and says, hey, can you serve on the greeter committee? <laughs> hey, can you teach a Sunday school class? Hey, you want to sing with a choir? And you're thinking, oh, I work six days a week already. 
I've got a family at home. I'm taking care of my mother. One more thing. That's maybe what Peter was thinking when Jesus comes to him. Kind of sounds crazy and maybe even cruel in, in reality. But Jesus was about to meet two of Peter's greatest needs at one time that day. You see, Peter was only thinking about the loss that he was taking. But his greatest need was to get to know Jesus. And that's the greatest need that any of us have, or the people in our lives have, to get to know Jesus. We have moments like this in our lives, these moments like Peter, where we feel overworked, we feel stressed, we feel tired, like we don't have enough. And sometimes it means that we feel alone. Sometimes it means that we feel scared and afraid of the future because no one else understands. No one else knows the needs that we have. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31, Jesus says, Don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? And he points to the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. What he's saying is that your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs, and you don't have to be afraid anymore. Here's the second lesson. Jesus not only knows your needs, but he provides for them. In our story, Jesus says, why don't you push out a little bit so I can sit in the boat and teach others now. Peter could have easily said, hey, no way, I'm exhausted, I'm going home, why don't you ask James and John? But that's not what Peter did. He took Jesus out in the boat and it put Peter in a position where Jesus could bless him and meet his needs. You know, that's what happens when we come to church or we do something to bless someone else. When we listen to the voice of Jesus inviting us to come or to do something, we find that that's just what we need. God uses that simple act to bless us and to meet both a spiritual need and often a physical need. Which actually leads to the third lesson we can learn from this text. When we obey Jesus' invitation, it puts us in a place where he can fulfill our need. A lot of people recognize this. When they're in crisis, they come into the church. A small, still voice beckons them to come. And when they do, they often find what they need. I can't tell you how many times over the 40 years of my ministry, someone has come in in distress, whether they've heard a message or a song that speaks to their, their heart, or, or a conversation they have with someone or myself, before long, a peace settles in because they listened to that voice and they came to this place where God said, we can minister to you. For Peter was following Jesus' command to put out his nets one more time and meant going against his best instincts as a fisherman. But he followed Jesus' command and his reward was overwhelming. Jesus supplied his need and a whole lot more. Listen, this is important because if Peter had not obeyed Jesus here and let the nets down again, there would have been no great catch of fish. Peter's needs would not have been met because you can't catch any fish when you're standing on the shore, which is where Peter was headed. Obedience is always a path to blessing. Even if it's scary, if you need God to provide, if you need God to meet your needs, it begins with doing what you already know God wants you to do. His blessing is always on the other side of obedience. What is Jesus asking you to do today? Is he asking you to deal with that recurring sin that's been in your life a long time? Is he asking you to put down the bottle? Is he asking you to walk away from a relationship dating relationship you know is wrong for you? Is he asking you to get back into church? Does he want you to find a place of service within the church or the community where you can bring glory to his name? Now, if that's a step of obedience Jesus is asking you to take, I want to encourage you to talk to me today or to talk to someone. At the end of our service today, there's going to be a couple of deacons here, and if you want to pray with them about this, they will pray with you. Here's the fourth takeaway from our story today. Sometimes Jesus will provide for us and our needs supernaturally. 
God is a miracle worker. There's another song that the praise team sings about God being the miracle worker. And there are times when God will meet your need or my need miraculously, just like he did for Peter. It wasn't a coincidence that the fish were flowing at that moment when Jesus told them to put the nets down. It was like Jesus had his sonar out saying to the fish, come, come, come. And they came and responded to his will in a supernatural way. Peter was awestruck by the number of fish they caught. God had provided for his needs supernaturally. And that miracle opened Peter's eyes to who Jesus really was. And it brought Peter to his knees and set the stage for him to say yes to Jesus and answer his call. You know, there are a lot of things that we can't explain in life. We try to write them off as coincidence or luck or karma. A couple of weeks ago, um, Pastor Enrique talked about luck, a word that we should never use. Because, because really, when we call it luck or coincidence or magic or mystery, it really often is God. And we need to give God the glory. You see, God uses these miracles to help unbelievers come to faith. When there are no other explanations, they make the presence of God real. And finally, and this one speaks to most of us who are here today, Jesus provides for our needs to deepen our maturity. I want you to understand this. Jesus didn't just take Peter into the deeper water so that he could catch fish. Jesus took Peter into the deeper waters to deepen his faith as he provided his needs. You see, when you learn to trust Jesus in small things, you begin to trust him in bigger things. Jesus wants you to put your life in his hands, and he's always working together for good for those who love and trust him so that they can trust him more. And the truth is, many of us can can share the fact that our faith is built on little, small steps of faith, that that we saw Christ acting in our lives, and those small things led us to trust Him more and more and more, and the more we trust Him, the more He provides for us. We say, God is good, and people respond all the time. But God wants you to believe it in the depths of your heart, not just a response He wants you to believe so deeply that you can focus your life on following Him like Peter and Andrew and James and John did. In that moment when the fish were overflowing, they knew that Jesus could provide everything they needed one way or another. And that if they followed Him, they would experience that again and again and again. It's this principle about faith upon faith. When you take a small step, Jesus meets your needs there, and you're more likely to take another bigger step. Because you see how God has been faithful in the past, and you know you can trust Him going forward. I want to just invite you as we close off today to trust Jesus to provide for your needs. To be like Simon Peter, who when God calls you to do something, you can say yes because you know without a doubt that God will have your back, that he will provide what you need so that you can do what he's called you to do. This morning, if you have a need that hasn't been met, I want to invite you to take a step of faith. Come down at the end of our service and let one of our deacons pray with you. Whatever that need is, maybe it's a need for healing, maybe it's a financial need, maybe it's a a need for guidance in some area of your life, but come down, they'll be right here up in front to pray with you, and I pray that you'll go away and in a few weeks you'll have a testimony to share, to say, God is good, Jesus provided for all that I needed, I trusted him, and in trusting him, I saw what he could do. Amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn today. It's Trusting 